Amazing song. Can you guys hear me? Hello? Oh, oh, yeah. Okay, I see some thumbs up. Cool. Um, you go ahead and be turning your Bible to Haggai 2. We're going to start in Haggai 2, which is 20 to 22. And um, so, okay, I'm just going to say a quick prayer before we jump into the Word here. Uh, you guys can pray with me. Heavenly Father, I just thank you, God, today for the opportunity to speak to your people. God, I do ask that you take me out of the picture, and God, that they can hear your word, and they can hear your heart, and they can see your desire for us as a church today. And it's your son's just I pray. Amen. Amen. So uh, we kind of went to the book of Haggai, and, you know, that was like an amazing sermon of just understanding that you know, when we get to the point where we start to obey God, um, when the Jews got to the point where they started to obey God and building the foundation of his church instead of their homes, he, he comes in and, and, and um, Haggai 2, he makes this, God kind of makes this promise to them. And we'll start in verse 20. He says, the word of the Lord came to Haggai a second time on the 24th day of the month. Tell Zerubbabel, governor of Judea, that I am going to shake the heavens and the earth. I will overturn royal thrones and shatter the power of the foreign kingdoms. I will overthrow chariots and their drivers. Horses and their riders will fall, each by the sword of his brother. You know, and um, I'm kind of meditating on this scripture, kind of after the sermon, going back and just looking at things. And, you know, I remember just thinking, wow, this is, this is how God reacted to their obedience. This is kind of God's you know, kind of coming in and saying, all right, you guys obey, now this is going to be what I'm going to do. And I'm like, wow, this is mind-blowing. You know, just, just God's decision at this point is, I'm like, whoa, what does God do when I obey? You know, what's that? What's the thing of epic proportion that God is going to do when I obey? Um, what does God promise us when we obey? And this kind of just led me into this you know, I'm, I'm reading and referencing, kind of led me into this, this zone or, or area where I started to ask myself this question, do I still believe that God can do miracles? Do I generally still believe that God can do miracles? God can do things of epic proportions like he did with Jews in our lives today. And, you know, and, and, and not, not in some of the ways that, you know, I've kind of, I guess over the, over the last couple of years being a disciple to find miracles, like, Hey, I got an A in the test that I didn't really study too hard for, you know, or, oh, that's crazy. You know, I managed to, you know, get this little thing done. And this is an amazing miracle that God has done for me. But like miracles and the proportion that the Bible describes them as, where, where God just heals the sick and raises people from the dead. And I kept asking myself that question, as we obey God, as we start to make steps towards obedience to God, do we do I still believe do we still believe that God can do those kind of miracles and you know and yes what if God still wants to do those kind of miracles with us as well because we always wrestle with that question you know I think we always wrestle with the question of yeah I know God can do it but you know is he but is he, I know God can but will he you know I know God can do this amazing things but will he do it today is it something he's going to do in our lives and we we kind of go back and forth and wrestle with those questions so I kind of want us to just look at some scriptures today just to kind of you know see as you know as, as, as a church as people of mercy like what are with our obedience to God what what is our what are kind of our expectations that God can do with us when we start to obey God what are we looking for so what are those you know, how can we have a vision of epic proportion and miracles as well? Um, and we're just going to examine, we're going to start off by examining two scriptures here in Luke 8. You can go ahead and turn your Bible to Luke 8. We'll start in verse 40. Um, you know, but again, like, again, this, and just asking this question, what was so special about the people of the Bible that they had all these epic moments, but for us today, we kind of just have to hang out and wait for heaven to come you know we don't get to experience any of these some of the amazing things that happen in the scripture and happen in the bible but starting look eight um starting in verse actually i'm going to start in verse 43 i apologize so then a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years but no one could heal her she came up behind him and touched the edge of his cloak and immediately her bleeding stopped 
Who touched me, Jesus asked. When they all denied it, Peter said, Master, the people are crowding and pressing against you. But Jesus said, Someone touched me. I know the power has gone out from me. Then the woman, seeing that she could not go unnoticed, came trembling and fell at his feet. In the presence of all the people, she told why she had touched him and how she had been instantly healed. Then he said to her, Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace. Um, and here we kind of see, yeah, and the funny thing about this, this particular scripture is I've always read it in light of, um, you know, like, oh, this, this is, this is kind of such a weird story just kind of placed in Jesus' journey where, you know, when people usually came, with, when people usually needed miracles from Jesus, they would come to Jesus in person. They would find a way to get his attention you know, the stories of him calling out, you know, master, master, help us. And, and they would really reach out to Jesus and ask what they desired. And Jesus would go ahead and, and, and help them. But in this case, she kind of decided to take the sneaky avenue. Like, you know, she didn't, she didn't present herself. She didn't reach out. She just kind of decided to hide behind everything and touch him. And I think it's, it, 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 you know, just digging deeper into it and I'm starting to understand why she went about, why she went about the way she did, because back in the Jewish, Jewish days, I mean, today, you know, where she was at, she would have been considered unclean. You know, it would have been like, it, it, her, the, the act of her touching a, a, a rabbi while being unclean could have been the end of her. You know, because rabbis needed to be clean to be able to go to, the, to go to to able to go to the temple and preach, and her doing that would have made the rabbi unclean, which meant the rabbi couldn't get his paycheck. Which you know he could have decided to have her stoned in that moment. He could have turned around and decided to have her stoned and killed. So this woman here had faith beyond you know the norm. Like she was willing to die. Because because of what she believed just touching Jesus could bring for her. Because the, the outcome would have been nothing would have happened. She would have gone found out and you know, stoned to death and killed. You know, but she had so much faith in God. And there's, you know, and even just digging deeper into the scripture, I kind of, you know, got into this Jewish mindset of what, what um, some Jewish Christians have been, have been thought of further about the scripture. They go into saying she, she when, when, it, when the Bible references her touching the hem of his garment, it would have been a tassel that would have been attached to his tallit. And these are some like big Jewish terms, but tallit or the prayer shawl was something that, that, that the Jews um, prayed with. Um, and there's even references to the fact that, you know, that her, what she did was, was, a, um, was kind of an Old Testament prophecy being manifested in that moment. You know, and I think these are the same, these are part of what would have like astounded Jesus about her faith. Not only was she willing to die for what she wanted God to do for her, she was also very knowledgeable of the scripture, you know, very knowledgeable of, 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 of um, what the scripture said, said Jesus, what the scripture said about her touching the hem of his garment. And in that belief and with that faith, she went ahead and, and, and did that and got her miracle. You know, and this is just, this story to me is just an amazing, it's like an amazing contrast to the next one we're going to look at in Mark 6, verses 1 to 6, you know, but, but again, in seeing, again, we're talking about what, what it means when we start to obey God, right? And this woman steps out of faith, obeys God, and has this miracle happen to her. But let's see a stack, uh, another verse in stack contrast to this in Mark 6, 6, verse 1 to 6. It says, Jesus left there, starting in verse 6, Jesus left there and went to his hometown, accompanied by his disciples. When the Sabbath came, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who had heard him were amazed. Where did this man get these things, they asked? What's this wisdom that has been given to him? What are these remarkable miracles he is performing? Isn't this the carpenter? Isn't this Mary's son, the brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon? Aren't his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. And Jesus said to them, a prophet is not without honor, except in his own town, amongst his relatives and in his own home. He could not do any miracles there, except lay his hands on a few sick people and heal them. He was amazed at your lack of faith. 
you know, again, another scripture, stark contrast to um, kind of what this woman did to step out of faith and, 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 and in a position that could have ended her life. We kind of see Jesus here in his own hometown. And it says Jesus is unable to perform any miracles amongst them because of the lack of faith. Like Jesus is actually amazed at how, at, at how much the impact of their faith, um, the impact of their lack of faith. Uh, um, effect of what he could do here but I thought something was very unique about this scripture though because he still does he still does some miracle here you know he still goes ahead and heals a few sick people and you know kind of does you know what I consider the the, the, the little things you know I kind of I kind of started to think of as you know for those of us that are or oh, even for me, like, you know, like, oh, yeah, you know, I was able to succeed in that test, and I drove to work and didn't die today. Yay, God, there's this amazing miracles, miracle in my life. But he was unable to do remarkable miracles among them because of their lack of faith. And the other thing that's really interesting about the scripture is these weren't like, these weren't a bunch of unbelievers. These were Jews that, for the most part, if they sat in the same room as you and I today, worshiping God, we wouldn't be able to tell the difference. You know, these were Jews that loved God, like, deeply. God-fearing Jews, you know, that in any sense of the word represents us today, the church. And Jesus in their midst was unable to do anything amongst them because of their lack of faith. You know, he kind of, he's kind of only able to do the little things. And, and so, do we as a church have faith enough that in keeping to God's promises that he can move heaven for us as well? Kind of like he says in the book of Haggai. You know, and, and one of the things that also stands out to me just about, again, this whole scripture is, I believe that here, like us as a church here in Mercer, that if God never gets a chance to work amongst us, even in 2020, regardless of, COVID and everything that's going on, it won't be because for some crazy reason, you know, Satan's power was more predominant here or just people just weren't willing to hear and there wasn't open people. It would be because those of us that believe in God didn't have faith enough to stand up and be counted for. You know, if God is unable to move amongst us as a church and as a people, it would be because we didn't have faith enough to stand up and be counted for. See, in both scriptures, we see the same Jesus, same power, two completely different results. You know, there's no guarantee that we can do more than have faith until we actually have faith. Yeah, there's no guarantee that we as believers can do more than have faith until we actually have faith. So the big question becomes, what kind of faith are we talking about? You know, what's this level of faith that we need to have that in in the situation that we find ourselves, that God can still move amongst us today. And, and, and we're gonna talk about a couple things here. Matthew was, let's go ahead and turn to Matthew 8, verse 5 to 13. We'll look at three main scriptures here to kind of define what's the kind of faith that we need to have to see God move amongst us in this time, in today's day and age with everything going on with COVID and the weird world. Um, to be able to see God still do amazing miracles amongst us, even here in Mercer, what's the kind of faith that we need to have? And in Matthew 8, verse 5 to 13, it says, When Jesus had entered Capernaum, the centurion came to him asking for help. Lord, he said, my servant lies at home paralyzed, suffering terribly. Jesus said to him, shall I come and heal him? The centurion replied, Lord, I do not deserve to have you come under my roof. But just say the word, and my servant will be healed. For I myself am a man under authority, with soldiers under me. I tell this one, go, and he goes, and that one, come, and he comes. I say to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed and said to those following him, Truly I tell you, I have not found anyone in Israel with such great faith. I say to you that many will come from the east and the west and will take their place at the feast with Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and the kingdom of heaven. But the subjects of the kingdom will be thrown outside into the darkness, so they'll be weeping in national teeth. Then Jesus said to the centurion, Go, let it be done just as you believed. 
as he believed it would, and his servant was healed from that moment. And here, you know, we see the, the first, kind of my first point per se is the faith that God goes wow begins with a posture of recognizing who God is. Like, really, who is God? You know, like, like who's the God we're claiming to serve? Who's the God that we're worshiping? You know, like, understanding who God is, faith that has a posture that fully understands who God is, is the type of faith we need to see God move in our lives today. Um, and, you know, faith is not just the mental assent of the fact that God exists. Like, us just coming to church and believing that, hey, God, God is real and God exists, it's, it's, that's, that's just not the faith that encourages God to move. You know, the faith that encourages God to move in, in ways that we can see as miraculous and amazing signs here, even in Mercer in today's day and age and with everything that's going on requires a posture that understands the character of God. And something very unique about this centurion is like, like he's, he's a centurion, he's an he's a army leader. And so he understands, you know, that, like, that when he says, when he says to the soldier to go do this, they do it. Um, and he ties, he ties his belief to his faith. You know, how, how many of us can claim that we can tie those same beliefs that we have to our faith? When we have issues where, you know, where some, you know, where we're struggling with some ailment and need to go see a doctor, how many of us have faith enough to say, no, God, you designed a body. So I don't need to wait for a surgeon to cut me open and heal me. I need you to come in and work in my life. You know, how many of us have faith to the extent where we can believe that the same God that authored and built us as we are is able to go in and take care of issues that concern us, you know, without, without necessarily external, you know, an external output, external belief. And I think that's the amount of faith that the centurion is displaying here. Like he, he understands what authority means and he understands that Jesus is a person in authority and he says, do it, just say the word, you know, say the word and it'll be done. Um, so I think that's the first point of faith that encourages God to go wow begins with a posture of recognizing God, who God is. And we need to ask ourselves that question, who do we believe the God that we serve is? And if we and, and I think start doing the, the whole idea of trying to understand that clearly starts with us just digging into scripture, you know, going back to the text, we got to read our Bible. And I have this, there's this uh, minister I always listen to, his name is Aaron Couch, and he always has this saying where he's, he, he always says it's in the text. If you're looking for anything, if there's a question you have, it's in the text, like go back to the scriptures, go back to the Bible. Um, I think for us as well, we need to go back and dig in to understand who is this God that we serve and worship um, and how can he move amazingly amongst us. So again, first point, we need to have a posture that understands who God is. Second scripture here in Luke 17, go ahead and turn in Luke 17, we'll read from verse 11 to 19. Sorry, verse 11. It says, now on his way to Jerusalem, Jesus traveled along the border between Samaria and Galilee. As he was going into a village, 10 men who had leprosy met him. They stood at a distance and called out with a loud voice, Jesus, master, have pity on us. When he saw them, he said, go, show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were cleansed. One of them, when he saw saw he was healed, came back, praising God in a loud voice. He threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked them. And he was a Samaritan. Jesus asked, were not all ten cleansed? Where are the other nine? Has no one returned to give praise to God except this foreigner? Then he said to him, rise and go, your faith has made you well. And kind of my second point, a second thought here is, faith is deeply rooted in gratitude. Again, faith that makes God move in miraculous ways among us is deeply rooted in gratitude. And I love that scripture in Psalms 8, where it says, When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have set in place, what is mankind that you are mindful of them, human beings that you care for them? You know, like, of all the things God has to do today, like, who, who am I that he's like, oh, you know, let me let me go look out for this cheeks guy. Let me go check in this cheeks guy. So faith takes this pro posture of gratitude 
then in the scope of all things, all the things that God has to do, I'm grateful that he would even be concerned enough to hear my prayers. You know, and we can even go back and, and, and kind of a reference to that to his, um, you know, as long as in the, in the book of Hebrews 3, it says, who were they that heard and rebelled? Were they not those Moses led out of Egypt? And with whom, and with whom was he angry for 40 years? Was it not those who sinned? whose bodies perish in the wilderness, goes back to the Jews coming out of Egypt, and, and God takes them out of slavery and does all these amazing things for them, and they complain. They complain about manner. They complain about food, and it's like just zero gratitude for what God was taking them to. They were in the mir- middle of a miracle, and they completely missed it. And I think we can do the same thing. We can be in the middle of a miracle and completely miss it, if we cease to have gratitude, we cease to have a faith that is rooted in gratitude. You know, I can think of some of the ways God has been faithful to us in Mercer in the midst of, you know, COVID and everything going on. We've seen two people get baptized. You know, we, we've, we've gone to be a, a church that haven't lost anyone to this battle yet amongst us. We can, we can fully say that, you know, just everybody's healthy and everybody is, you know, is here today. And these are some of the, 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 the ways God has been working amongst us, you know, the, even, even with the way the world is right now. And, and yes, it's, it's something to be grateful for. It's something to have gratitude for. It's something to be we, the, the, the design of our faith that, that we still want God to do great things among us has to start from here and saying, God, with what you've done so far, we're grateful. What you've done so far, we're thankful. You know, and yeah, it's, sometimes it's hard. It's hard, you know, especially just <laughs> the, the battle of, of everything going on in the world. But we need to have, do we have gratitude for the way God has been moving amongst us so far? You know, faith that makes God wow has to have a posture of gratitude um, as well, you know. And just kind of the third point here, you know, turn again, Matthew 15. Oh, my bad, I made a mistake. Five baptisms this year. I apologize. I'm, wow, downplaying God's power. There's been five baptisms this year. So in the midst of everything going on, God has still moved miraculously even here, here in, in Mercer. And we need to have gratitude for that. This is even outside the fact that people that have even moved in, you know, I'm thinking of Shade, just moved in with us, you know, as well. And this is God moving amongst us in the absence of everything going on. Um, and I think for us to have a faith that wows God, we need to be we need to have a faith that, that shows gratitude as well. But in Matthew 15, verses 21 and 28, it says, leaving that place, Jesus withdrew to the region of Tyre and Sidon. A Canaanite woman from that vicinity came to him crying out, Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. My daughter is demon possessed and suffering terribly. Jesus did not answer a word. So his disciples came to him and urged him, send her away for she, for she keeps crying out after us. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. The woman came and knelt before him, Lord, help me, she said. He replied, it is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. Yes, it is, Lord, she said. Even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from your master's table. Then Jesus said to her, woman, you have great faith. Your, your request is granted. And her daughter was healed. You know, and, and this, this whole story, I, I, I remember talking about this um, with a brother and they just expressing how <laughs> I mean their version of this is definitely interesting but how grime it was what God says to them. But I, I would submit that God says what he says to them in this moment to kind of make a point to his disciples. You know, and maybe sometimes God working, working amongst us gets interrupted because we the church we're supposed to represent God's heart, we get in the way of it and don't care very much about the things that God cares about. You know, because you can kind of see his disciples here, they're like, hey, hey, send her away. Like, she's crying after us. Get, get rid of this woman so we can do what we have to do. So they had something so much more important to do because as far as I can remember, the whole journey with Jesus was them going and healing people and, and really kind of 
and, and God kind of showing them, you know, his, his, his uh, Jesus kind of bringing God's kingdom to earth at this point, but their concerns is completely far away in, in this particular moment that they're more concerned about the fact that she's just bothering them that I believe Jesus is almost just like, all right, you guys don't care. I guess I'm not going to care. I'm going to try to get rid of this woman. But she has a faith that has a sense of resolve that will not quit. And that's kind of the third point. Having a faith that has a sense of resolve that refuses to quit. You know, it's, it's like saying to God, God, I need a miracle. I need you to show up and keep your word. You know, like she, she goes over and challenges God to point. she's like yeah yeah no she's like hold up yes yes it is Lord she says even the dogs get to eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table um and because of that God is able to move in her life see I wonder how many times we quit praying right before God was going to do the thing that we were praying for you know I wonder how many times we just stopped praying right before God was going to do the things that we we're praying for, you know. So, so again, like I said earlier, we wrestle with this belief: God can do anything. I'm just not sure that He will. And I think it's important for us to understand that we need to have a resolve in what we believe in, what we want God, how we want God to move in our life. Now, again, I'm not saying that He'll do it. I'm not saying that everything you pray for is going to have an answer. Oh. Uh, but I'm saying that you can take a posture with God that you wouldn't stop praying until he does, you know? And, and, and I think that's also part of the important part of praying is that when we pray, we get this chance to kind of align our hearts with God's heart so that even if he doesn't do precisely what we were praying and what we were asking for, that we still believe that because he is God, you know, we're going to be okay because he's the, he's God that we believe in. Everything is going to work out for the best because he's God, regardless of the outcome. Um, the outcome is what, what his desire is for us. Um, we always get to that point where we, we always ask that question, you know, what is God's will for my life? Yeah. That's a, that's a question we, we ask all the time. And when we pray, we always, you know, we, we even say prayers like, Hey God, you know, I really want this thing to be done, but you know, God, you know, if it's your will, let it be done, you know, what's your will for my life? Maybe the question we need to be asking is what is, what is God's will? And then we take our lives and plug our lives into God's will and see where it takes us. You know, maybe that's the question we need to be ha asking as opposed to, hey, God, what's your will specifically for my life? It's fit for my outcome. You know, like, no, God, what is your will in my prayer so that I can plug myself into that and see where it takes me? Um, you know, one, one, of the, one of the reasons prayer is important is I have faith that God can do it. But my prayer allows me, you know, like I said, to plug, our, plug us into the heart of God um, so that whatever he chooses to do is okay. To be resolved in faith through prayer because I know God's character. I know that he can. But if he does not, because of his character and his nature, there's something better. Um, guys, I, I personally think that with everything that is, that is going on and with just the way the world is and even going further, we, we, that, that God wants to do something miraculously here at Mercer, something of epic proportions here at Mercer. God wants to use us to change the world here at Mercer but we need to have faith enough to stand up and be counted for. You know, faith is a total commitment to a lifestyle governed by God, got by God's will for the world done God's way. You know, and, and, and we just think about everything going on this year and everything that we've experienced and, and like how, how is the year going to end? How is next year going to look? Um, how, how are we ever going to come out of this pandemic? What's it going to look like? I'm not going to just, but all the questions that we have, but in, in taking that decision and taking that, that kind of what we started in Haggai, that faithful moves to start to stop rebuilding a house and start rebuilding God's house and start rebuilding his foundation. Um, what are our dreams for what God can do with us in this, when we make those decisions? 
you know, I think it's one thing to go, hey, yeah, you know, we're going we're gonna to start, uh, we're going to go back and build God's house. But what do we even see as a vision of that? I mean, God makes them all these promises. What are promises that God is making to us? What are the promises that we see God fulfilling when we decide to take a faith that understands who God is, when we decide to take a posture of faith that, is, that has gratitude, and when we decide to take a posture of faith that refuses to quit? You know, what do we see God doing in our lives here in Mercer of epic proportion? Um, I know we usually get into this point where we have a conversation um, and I just kind of had two questions. And in light of 2020, do we still believe that God can do miracles of epic proportions here in Mercer? And if we say we do, what are some of those things that we want to see God doing? What are some of those ways that we want to see God moving here and beyond um, amongst us here in Mercer as we, as we um, decide to rebuild God's kingdom and be a people of, of faith? Amen. That's it. Mic on. Thank you.